All right, welcome everyone to our the third of our four part series on um, backyard farming, small flock poultry. Uh, the, we're calling it the poo sessions. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, actually taking fecal samples. My name is Megan Purdue. I am the ag agent in Worcester County, Maryland. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, as always, we have a disclaimer on there. The advice in this presentation does not represent medical or veterinarian or legal advice. Um, always seek competent veterinary advice when possible. And if we use a website product or brand, it's not an endorsement. It's probably just the only thing that we have available as an example. Um, and then for this one, any laboratories that we list are just examples. It does not imply that we have any personal experience utilizing their services. We cannot vouch for them. All right, um, Dr. Batista last week uh, spoke about this just a little bit, but for those who weren't here and it's kind of a review, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about internal parasite and how internal parasite infection occurs. Um, with internal parasites, the eggs are passed in the feces. Um, there are direct life cycles and indirect life cycles. For direct life cycles, the birds eat the eggs that have developed usually off the ground next to a pile of feces or manure. Um, for the indirect life cycle, there's an intermediate host involved. Um, the intermediate host would eat the eggs and then your poultry, your birds would eat the intermediate host like a bug or a worm. Um, and then from there, once it's in the bird, the parasites develop. And then once they're mature, they produce eggs that are passed on in the feces. The cycle starts all over again. So here's a graphic about the direct life cycle. The adult worms are living inside the bird and they're producing eggs that are then passed in the feces. Chickens, poultry, they like to peck around. So they like to scratch around in manure piles. Um, they can pick up those eggs from the environment. And then once the eggs are ingested, the larvae develop and once they become adult worms, they start producing again. So it's a vicious cycle. Um, the indirect life cycle, very similar, but again, there is an intermediate host involved in that, um, and then the bird would eat the intermediate host. And as we know, we've explained in previous presentations, um, birds are not vegetarians, poultry are not vegetarians, they eat um, snakes, bugs, worms, small mice. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about symptoms of a high internal parasite load. And I would say high internal, high internal because um, it is normal to find some parasite eggs in a fecal. Um, anything that eats off the ground is probably gonna have some internal parasites. Um, but what we're concerned is when there is a high internal parasite load. So the symptoms that you'll see are gonna depend on the species of the parasite. You may see diarrhea and or bloody diarrhea. Uh, wait, and remember back to last week, the poopology was a great uh, lesson on that. Um, you may see weight loss in your birds, a slow growth if you have young birds. Um, you may notice some lethargy, paleness, there may be respiratory signs, or you may have dead birds. If that's the case, then you should get a necropsy to confirm what the cause was. Um, and if you'll notice, a lot of these also overlap into other diseases as well. All right, so what is the fecal? We come, and if you talk to me about it, I'm gonna call it a fecal. A lot of people call them fecals, but it's just short for a fecal examination. Um, since those internal parasites pass our eggs through the feces, then we are able to look at the feces and determine what parasites are present um, and how high the load is. So commonly what we're looking for are roundworms. We also look for coccidia in a fecal. Um, but what we're gonna do is use a microscopic examination to identify the eggs so what species they are, and or estimate the quantity. And that's estimated in eggs per gram, EPG. So if you go to have a fecal done, you may notice two different options, a qualitative fecal or a quantitative fecal. The qualitative fecal is going to identify the species of eggs found. Um, that's important when you are trying to decide on a dewormer to use. You want to make sure that you use a dewormer that, or any kind of drug. So if it's um, coccidia, it's a dewormer is not going to not going to work, um, so that's why it's important to know what you are exa what exactly you're dealing with, and then a quantitative is going to be identification plus the eggs per gram, and the eggs per gram is important to know whether or not you have a high enough load that you need to treat for it. All right, so why would we do fecal? So we want to monitor parasites in the flock. Um, this allows us to avoid unnecessary treatments 
which also come with withdrawal periods. Um, with internal parasites, they do develop resistance to anthelmintics or dewormers. Um, so we, if you've ever looked for a chemical dewormer, you'll notice that you have very few options that are labeled for poultry. Um, so we want those, we want to keep the few options that we have uh, working. So we don't want to expose parasites to them unless we need to. Um, so, and then we don't want to do any unnecessary treatments because one, that is extra cost, that's extra labor. Um, and then you have that withdrawal periods where you may not be able to eat um, either meat bird, you might not, you may have to wait until you can process the bird, or you may have to throw out eggs depending on what's used. And as always, when I talk about this type of stuff, um, I want to caution you that off-label use of dewormers. So if you use something that is not labeled for chickens or the type of poultry that you are deworming, um, then you that must be done under the direction of a veterinarian. Um, this can also, fecals can also identify problems with specific birds. So if you have one bird or two birds that are within your flock that are having some issues, you might be able to figure it out with a fecal. Um, you can also use them to rule out parasite problems. Uh, fecals are fairly non-invasive and easy to collect. Um, and as I stated earlier, there's a lot of diseases that have overlapping symptoms. Um, it's also, this would also be an important tool to evaluate your new birds. So if you are bringing birds into your flock and particularly older birds, um, then you want to test them to see if they are bringing anything in there because you want to avoid bringing parasites from other farms into your flock. And if you are evaluating your new birds, I would do a fecal um, when you get them while they're in quarantine and I, if necessary, treat them. And then I would do a follow-up fecal afterwards to make sure that uh, the drug that you use worked. All right, so the important, how do we take fecals? Uh, first thing that I would tell you is determine where you're gonna send the sample or the samples. Um, Cause there's gonna be instructions for each laboratory and they might be different. So you wanna go ahead and determine that first so that you know how to take the samples um, and how to package them. And then if there are no specific instructions given, then I would contact the laboratory and find out. There are certain, some labs may only run fecals on certain days. So you wanna make sure that you send them at the appropriate time so the fecals aren't sitting for several days and you know when you're gonna get your results back. Um, some of them may have them packaged a certain way. So just make sure that you get the instructions, um, get all the supplies that you're gonna need ready. Um, you don't wanna get everything done and find out you don't have a box to ship it in. And um, then you're going to collect the samples and send them to the laboratory. All right, where can we send the samples? Well, your veterinarian is always going to be an option if you, in fact, do have a veterinarian. Um, but what you want to keep in mind is for, if you're using a veterinarian for a fecal, one, it might be a little pricier, but um, they may require that the chickens you're sending them from or the birds you're sending them from are current patients. Um, it might be that as long as, you know, you use them for your cats and dogs, they'd be willing to send it off, but they may require that the birds themselves be patients. And some of them may require that they actually examine the birds. Um, there are private laboratories that you can send them to. Um, one example would be Mid-America Agricultural Research. Um, and that's just one that I've found through doing a quick search. There are university laboratories too, um, but make sure that they provide services for out-of-state residents if it is not in your state. And sometimes if they're if you're not in their state, they might provide the services, but there may be a surcharge on it. Um, University of Minnesota and Purdue University are two that, uh, according to their websites, do fecals. And then there's state diagnostic laboratories. Again, those might be, those services from them might only be available to residents of the state, or there may be a surcharge if you're out of state. Um, generally, these are going to be low cost. And here in the Mid-Atlantic, in Maryland and Delaware, Maryland Department of Agriculture and Delaware Department of Agriculture are two options. Here's an example of the instructions from, this one's Mid-America Agricultural Research. Um, they do multiple species and they have their prices broken down and they also have the instructions. I know this one's a little small, um, difficult to see, but it is right on their website. And then this one be example from Purdue. Um, it tells you what the fee is, what their turnaround time is when they run the tests, what species they'll, uh, they will examine, and then some shipping information. They want it fresh, chilled, but not frozen. 
All right, some of the sampling supplies that you would need a clean disposable gloves. Um, that's if you, you could use a bag turned in inside out. Um, but if you wanna be sure that you're keeping everything clean and not cross contaminating, you probably wanna add an extra level of protection and uh, put on some disposable gloves. Plastic baggies, you're gonna need one clean bag per sample. Um, a permanent marker to label the bag. Um, and then if you are collecting flock samples from under a roof, roost or under a pen, um, you're gonna need some sort of collection device. Um, I'll show you in a little bit how to use plastic trash bags, but you could also use like a plastic sheet. Um, probably some painter supplies may also work um, or like a clean plastic bin, maybe a um, soda flat, um, something that's gonna collect it, but you also something you wanna make sure that it is a clean device so that you're not cross contaminating. Some of the shipping supplies that you'll need to include is going to be your submission form from the lab that you're going to use. Um, you're going to want to include payment. Some of them will not proceed without the payment, um, but you certainly don't want that to delay your analysis. Um, a box for shipping, a styrofoam cooler if you have them, and generally a disposable ice pack. Um, our little hot cold ice pack is rep just in this picture is just representing um, ice pack, but you would want, you're not going to get that stuff back. So you want to use something that's disposable. Um, if you get vaccines um, from a mail, if you order vaccines to be shipped in, generally they're going to come in a styrofoam cooler. So I always keep them when I get them. And then the disposable ice packs, I throw them back in my freezer so that I can send them with them. If you don't have a styrofoam cooler, I have used styrofoam um, egg cartons before um, to help keep everything cool and, and packed it really well inside a cardboard box um, with plenty of ice packs. When you collect your samples, again, you wanna avoid cross-contamination. Um, you don't want feces from another sample cross-contaminating con the current sample. Um, use all clean collection bags and devices. A new bag and gloves for each sample. And then if you were, Doing a flock sample, make sure that you mix that flock sample thoroughly, um, because you're taking them from you're taking feces from different birds, but you're only they're only going to analyze one sample. They're going to pull just a subsample out of the sample that you send them, and there's no guarantee that once it gets to the lab that they're going to make sure that it's mixed thoroughly. So I would make sure that you mix it thoroughly before you send it off. Um, so that everything is, all the different individual samples are mixed together. Um, and then you may need a history for each sample, especially if you're going to a diagnostic lab. Um, they're probably going to want to know the type of bird, whether maybe it's a meat bird, a layer, a pullet, adult bird. Um, they may want to know the different species, any symptoms that they're having, any prior treatments that you've given them. Again, the age of the bird, the number of birds, and your reason for sending in the samples. For flock samples, you may want to take them just to monitor internal parasite load as part of routine surveillance. Um, it may be that you need to diagnose a production problem. Maybe you're seeing weight loss in your birds and you want to make sure it's not the it's not parasites before you start looking at your feed. Um, if you're experiencing poor egg production, this can be another rule out. Um, it's, will also give you a general idea of the parasite load in your flock. Um, but the problem with this one, it's not gonna identify individuals who are carrying high parasite load. If you wanna take a flock sample, um, check again, check with the laboratory to find out how large each sample should be. Uh, Cornell tells you 10 grams. Uh, I think this is Alabama Cooperative Extension Service says half a cup. Um, and you wanna collect a representative sample of fresh feces. So if you were out in your run, then you need to cover the whole area and collect partial fresh fecal samples from the big areas. If it is a large sample, if it ends up being a large sample, you want to make sure you mix it well and then send a subsample of whatever quantity they want to the lab. I'm going to place them in sealed plastic baggies and then again, label each sample with permanent marker. And you want to use a label that's going to tell you where the sample came from. It doesn't make any difference to the lab what you call it. Um, for example, mine, I might call it Hank's pen because my rooster hasn't, my rooster's name is Hank the tank. Um, so I may say Hank's pen so that I know it came out of, it came from the hen, him and the hens that are with him. Or you may say it's the duck run or 
uh, the Rhode Island Reds or the White Leggerns, something that you will know where it came from when you get the results back. Um, and then you want to prepare the samples for transport. If you are taking it somewhere locally, take it directly to the lab or to your veterinarian. Um, if it's got to be shipped out, make sure you refrigerate it, but do not freeze it. Um, for taking flock fecal samples, it's easier if you lock your flock in a coop at night. If you do that, then you can put down, and especially if it's a fairly small coop, you can put down plastic under the roost because they're going to poop and you can collect it in the morning. Um, another option might be to clean out the coop and put down fresh bedding and pick up the samples in the morning. Um, but you want to collect around a dozen fresh samples. If you're collecting them from the pen, you want to collect at least around a dozen fresh samples, um, being careful not to cross contaminate. All right, so this is, I put this into practice for you. I did not send off a fecal sample, but I did try it to make sure that it works because I have a small flock that goes up into a coop at night, otherwise the fox eats them. Um, so it was January, so it was getting dark around 5.30. They went up. So after they went up into their coop, I laid, I cut open some plastic bags and I laid them under the coop. And I, I covered the entire area just to make sure. Um, and then I locked the coop so that they can't come out. And again, that's more for their safety. Um, I went back out there about three hours later. And as you can see, they had already given me some samples. If I was going to send that off, I could have probably just taken up the plastic sheets and bagged it and put it in the refrigerator and shipped it out the next morning. Um, but I wanted to see what would happen in the morning. So I went back around 830. It was the weekend, so I wasn't getting up early. I went out there about 830 in the morning and I opened it up and you could see where they gotten up since the sun had come up they'd gotten up and they'd done some scratching around so they pushed the plastic bags around the fecals were still on there um, so I still could have used that but if you are doing this I would suggest either go out a couple out after they've been up for a couple of hours or try to get out there before the sun comes up and they get up and going um, so that they don't ruin your sample but it would have it would have worked either way in this situation um, here's another option that I tried, which would be to clean the coop out and put down fresh bedding. So with this one, again, by morning, they had started scratching around in the new shavings. Um, but I did find under the roost, there was still plenty of samples. They were just covered in shavings. Um, so I did bag them. But if you take this approach, you're going to have to pick the litter out of the samples. Uh, because the lab is not, the lab technicians are not going to sit there and separate the litter from the feces. So that's going to be your job. You're going to have to pick it out. So it may or may, if you were to get out there again before they got off of their roofs, you might be able to pick out some fresh samples um, without having the litter all through it. Um, but if you wait until the sun comes up like I did, then it's going to cause you a little bit of a problem. If you're doing individual samples, um, these are useful if you want to identify or rule out a problem in an individual bird, like you're noticing symptoms in one individual bird and you suspect that might be it, or you just want to rule it out so you can look at more serious issues, um, then you want to take an individual sample. And you can identify a high parasite load in that individual. Um, this might allow you to treat just one bird instead of the whole flock if it comes to it, um, which is good for decreasing resistance and avoiding withdrawal periods for the rest of the birds, depending on the drug that you're using. All right, so how to collect a fecal from an individual bird? Well, if your bird dies, then you can just send it in for a necropsy and they'll look for the parasites. Um, you can follow it around and catch it on the run. I don't know if that would be my preferred way to do this. Um, I'm used to some larger animals. I've collected a ton of fecals on sheep and goats, and I like just be able to catch them, grab the fecal and move on. Um, but if you have to, you could follow it around and see if you can catch feces from that individual bird and know that that's who it came from. Um, there is a way that you can encourage the poop, the bird to poop in a bag. Um, we did not try that. My chickens, I, they did not volunteer for it. Um, but there is a way that you can hold them and put some pressure on their abdomen and hold the bag under them and try to get them to poop in the bag. Um, we did, again, we did not try that one. Um, probably my preferred method would be to isolate the bird in a clean pen and just collect fresh droppings from the pen. 
Um, again, you want to label the baggie with which bird it came from um, with a permanent marker. If you are in a situation where you don't know your birds, you can't tell your birds apart, um, you could leave that bird pent up or you could go out and get some leg bands um, that would help you. I think you can buy them pretty much any farm store. Um, you get some colored leg bands, which would label it as a problem bird. Um, that way, you know, go back to the bird with the yellow leg band or go back to the bird with a pink leg band. Um, and then again, you want to prepare that sample for shipping. Um, some tips, you want to collect samples based on your laboratory's availability. Again, you know, if they only run fecals Thursday and Friday, you don't want to necessarily have the, you don't need to have the fecals sitting there on Monday, but don't ship them at the end of the week. So they sit over the weekend. With these, you're generally going to want one to two day shipping. Um, I usually go by the weather. So if it's super, super hot, I'm going to lean towards the one day shipping. Um, if it's the middle of the winter, you'd probably be okay with the two day shipping. Um, save any disposable ice packs that you might get, um, especially if you're ordering other supplies that have to be kept cold. You want to save those ice packs if you plan on doing this so that you can um, use those or you can make your own and have them ready. Um, sometimes I will use the little 12 ounce soda bottle, plastic soda bottles, fill them up with water and freeze them. I have used those before instead of the commercial ice packs. And then again, collect contact the lab prior to collecting samples, especially if you are um, using like a state diagnostic lab, you want to give them a heads up that they're coming. Um, that way, if something has happened, like an avian influenza outbreak where everybody is busy, um, and that is not going to be a priority for them, you know, now's not the greatest time to collect them, or you can tell them, look, I have a bird that's very sick. Is there any way that you can go ahead and run this? Um, so it's always a good idea to contact them in case there's going to be any issues. Some other services that you might be, that might be available at the state diagnostic labs, necropsies, those are available at both in Maryland and Delaware, avian influenza testing, um, other report, they generally test for other reportable diseases, Again, contact the laboratory directly for availability and sampling instructions. And then some testing might have to be submitted by a veterinarian. So keep that in mind as well. Another caution on the off-label use of dewormers, because this is very important. And again, if you go looking for poultry dewormers, there's a lot of homeopathic things out there. Um, but as far as the tried and true drugs that we use, um, I have only found one available recently, and that was the fenbendazole formulated one. Um, so very few, sometimes no anthelmintics are labeled for use in poultry and available to you. If it's not labeled for poultry and you use it on poultry, it is considered off-label. It is illegal to use medications that includes antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, anthelmintics, et cetera, off-label unless under the direction of a veterinarian. Um, a valid veterinary client-patient relationship is necessary for your veterinarian to give you medical advice. Um, so don't be insulted if you call up there and ask them for advice and they can't give it to you because you're either not a current client, they've not seen that animal, or you're not a client at all. Um, they have to have that valid uh, client-patient relationship in order to legally give you that advice. Um, the reason is veterinarians can give guidance on withdrawal periods if it's not something that's labeled because usually you will look for food producing animals. And when you look through the instructions on a medication, it's going to tell you, usually give you um, for larger animals, a meat or a milk withdrawal, and then for chickens, a meat and an egg withdrawal if applicable. And then veterinarians have access to information that's unavailable to the general public, and they can share information amongst themselves. Um, so if, if there is something that is supposed to work and they've had adverse reactions to it, um, they can share that information. So but that might not be something necessarily that you know have access to. All right, and thank you. And we will answer any questions. We appreciate your time today.